I'm a pretty cynical person. I I won't lie. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm waiting to find out who's going to make money off me. I'm waiting to find out who's going to take advantage of me. Always on the lookout. Always a little suspicious. But I think there's one thing in this cruel world that's genuinely pretty selfless and moving, and that's organ donation. Whether it's from a deceased donor who made their wishes known or from a living donor, organ donation is a priceless gift. And it's a medical and administrative miracle. Today, we'll be digging into the details of organ transplant with Dr. Stephen Flam, a transplant hepatologist at Rush. We'll learn what causes the need for a transplant, what happens when you get the call, and how in the world you learn to live with someone else's organ in your body. We'll be talking a lot about livers today, but lots of what we'll learn about transplant applies to other organs too. We're not just talking about people who need organs, we're talking about donors, and we'll learn a little bit about living donation, which is exciting. Life before, during, and after transplant, whether you're giving or receiving, is life with a chronic condition. So let's talk about it. Fiance Alfonso with Adrian Parker Sr. did not um, survive this devastating stroke, but he was an organ donor. His gifts went to save 114 lives. I knew that I was going to be getting a liver from someone who was deceased, um, and I knew that I needed it. I knew that it was going to save my life. Even though I knew I would eventually need a transplant, I did not know much about the process, and I tried to stay away from Google to get some of my questions answered because some of the information I was reading and some of the stats were scary to learn about. So I tried to just ask my providers, my transplant team, all my questions. Life is good post-transplant. <laughs> We're also filming during an eclipse. So if you see the sun get darker or brighter behind me, the world is not ending. We are simply recording during a cosmic phenomenon. Welcome, Dr. Flam. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Melissa. You know, as I was walking over here today, I wanted to make sure I didn't look at the eclipse because then I was afraid I'd be blinded before I could do our podcast. So I successfully navigated the trip over here without being blinded. So I'm doing great. You're doing great. Just to kick us off, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about why you first got into hepatology in the first place? You know, that's a great question. I think that sometimes to myself, you know, my father was in the business world. I sold furniture back in the day when I was a young man and swimming pools, believe it or not. You know, back in medical school, even when they were teaching each discipline at a very basic level, for some reason, I always liked the study of liver disease. Uh, I found the diseases interesting. I thought the fact that we could really intervene in people that had very, very complicated problems that I found it uh, something that I was interested in. And then when I went to my residency uh, at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston at Harvard, we had a very, very inspirational clinician and teacher there who happened to be a hepatologist. And it just furthered my interest in studying and caring for patients with liver disease. And then in the end, I became a hepatologist and a transplant hepatologist. And it was has been a decision that I've never regretted. Each day when I come to work, I like taking care of patients with liver disease. I like identifying people that need to have life-saving liver transplantation and helping them get into a much healthier state. I love being able to help somebody who's who's dying and allow them to have a completely normal life thereafter. Why is having a hepatologist you trust uh, so important for someone getting a liver transplant? Listen, first of all, I think having a doctor you trust for any kind of doctor is important. You know, nobody wants to be sick, Melissa. Nobody wants to come to the doctor. Uh, they come because they have to. And, you know, hopefully, you know, you want a doctor that has two qualities. Number one is that they're smart, they know what they're doing, and they give you appropriate advice. And the second is that you feel connected to them. You need to trust them. 
you need to hopefully like them. I mean, not like them that you invite them to your house for dinner, but like them so that you feel that they have your best interests in mind and they're trying to help you and they spend time with you that you need to have spent uh, and that they provide the care that you uh, that you need. If they want a second opinion, for instance, I never say, I never express any reservations about that. I say, you know what? I'll help you. You tell me where you want your opinion and I will call the doctor there and I'll let them know you're coming and, uh, you know, and we'll go from there. Just like back in medical school, we're going to start at a very basic level talking about what the liver does. Can you explain it to me at just a very simple level, uh, the role of the liver in the body and a healthy person? Well, as a hepatologist, Melissa, I think the liver is the most important organ, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have fights about that with my colleagues who take care of other organs. Mm -hmm. But the liver is the liver is unique in that it is a basically the factory in the body. It does things every single day that allows us to survive. And there's only one of them. You know, there are two lungs and there are two kidneys, only one liver. And if your liver has very serious dysfunction, you in the end feel very sick and then you can have life-threatening complications. So the liver acts like a factory in the body. It helps process medications. It creates these proteins that tell other parts of the body what to do. You know, it helps to filter out toxins from the body. You know, the other great thing about the liver is you can have some damage to your liver, Melissa, and it still functions well. It's like a house. If a house starts to burn, it can start to be damaged, but still the house can be strong and stand. Only when it's destroyed, does it collapse? And the liver is very similar to that. So when we identify disease processes, we try very hard to intercede and reverse them before the liver collapses and the patient becomes sick. So you're the firefighter going in and making sure the fire doors are closed. You know, the structure is protected even if one room is destroyed, that kind of idea. That's exactly right. And you, you, the patient actually is a firefighter too. The patient has to work with us. We help them to put out the fire before the structure is damaged so much that, that the, the house collapses, or in this case, the liver collapses. One of the questions that's important is how does a person know or their doctor know if they have a liver problem in the first place? Even aside from the, the, the damage, how do you know if there is even a small fire burning? And the answer is there's really two ways. Number one is you may go to your doctor and they do liver blood tests and the liver blood tests are off even when you feel perfectly normal. It's a surprise to some people that they have abnormal liver tests because they may not even have any symptoms. And the second way you might know that there's a liver problem, even if your liver tests are normal, is if somebody gets a picture of your liver, an ultrasound, a CAT scan, an MRI. It may be for another reason. It may be because you have a hernia or some other problem that a picture is being taken. And we notice on the side that your liver doesn't look right. So either of those two reasons are the most common ways that a person would even know they have a liver problem in the first place. Now, just because you have a liver problem, Melissa, doesn't mean your liver is very, very damaged or that you need a liver transplant. Liver problems are amongst the most common medical problems in the world. And there are many, many reasons, Melissa, people have liver problems out there. And one of the jobs that I have as a liver doctor is to not only determine why somebody has a liver problem, but to see if there's any actual damage to the liver, damage to the house, because those are the patients that we worry the most about. And everybody doesn't have damage. Many, many people who have a liver problem, even for years, don't develop serious liver damage from that problem. That's really my job. Is there damage or not to the house? And, and if so, how can we reverse it? How can we contain it? How can we, if possible, prevent it from worsening over time so that a patient would later get very sick and need a liver transplant? So his kidneys went to two different people. A left kidney went to a woman in her 60s, I believe, and a male in his 60s, um, his left one did. I think that's the right way. And then a, a woman received his liver. 
Then um, his tissues um, was donated, and that impacted, I believe it was 99 people in Michigan, Florida, and a couple other states. About being an organ donor, if you haven't thought about it, if you know of people that are on the fence about it, talk to them. You need to sign up. It, it's so important. There are so many people waiting on that list that need organs. And, you know, it's a perfect opportunity. If we all did it, we wouldn't have a shortage at all. So I think that's important. I'm definitely signed up. We have a lot of organs in our body, but only some of them are transplantable, or at least we figured out how to transplant them. Do we know why the liver is one of those organs that we figured out how to transplant from one person to another? Well, most organs we can actually transplant mm. now. Not mm. all, but most of them we can, at least the vital organs. You are exactly right, Melissa. Some of the organs are more difficult to transplant than others. Sometimes that's because of the surgical issues, not so much the medical issues that I take care of because I'm not a surgeon, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get an organ out and put it back in, out of a donor and put it into a recipient. Uh, sometimes organs are damaged a lot in a donor and therefore you wouldn't want to give it to a recipient. I'll give you an example, hearts. You know, a lot of people have some heart disease, and even if in the end they don't die from a heart problem and become a donor, uh, many, many, many people have a very functional liver, even when they're older, and the liver thus is very suitable for transplantation into a needy recipient. So that liver durability is sort of what makes it an ideal organ for transplantation. Absolutely. Now, the surgery to put in a liver, and again, I'm not a surgeon, Melissa, thank goodness. <laughs> but um, for the surgeons, I think the surgical operation is challenging for them uh, because there are a lot of blood vessels that go into the liver and come out of the liver. Uh, there are these little tubes called bile tubes or bile ducts that go into the liver that have to be connected from a donor into the recipient. Uh, these bile tubes, by the way, are like the waste pipes of a factory. They are the tubes that take the waste out of the liver, which is a factory, and take it away from the liver, just like a factory has pipes that take waste away. But from a surgical standpoint, all of these things need to be connected. So it, it sometimes can present a challenging operation for surgeons, but they can do it. Surgeons are unbelievably skilled and do the surgery. They've been doing liver transplants on a regular basis for well over 30 years. They've been doing transplants from before that too for the liver, but on a regular basis. And the surgeons now are outstanding and really do a great job at this particular procedure. Would you say that being a recipient of a donor organ makes you chronically ill? No, no, no. Once they get a liver transplant, they are not chronically ill. The vast, vast majority of patients, Melissa, that get a liver transplant feel spectacular. I've taken care of thousands of them in my career that have had liver transplants. Over 90% of patients are alive one year after liver transplantation. And keep in mind that we only do liver transplants on people that are already dying from liver disease. And the life that they have, Melissa, in general, is excellent. There are no restrictions on your activity after you heal up from the surgery. People can do whatever it was that they did before they were sick from their chronic liver disease. After a liver transplant, uh, livers don't have an expiration date. They don't last for a while and then start to poop out. They last theoretically forever. So, uh, you know, people do very well. They do liver transplants, Melissa, on babies that are born with liver problems, and those livers last indefinitely. They grow with the patient, and the patient gets married and has children. So they live a normal life. That's amazing. The human body is incredible. 
you know, we're talking about liver damage. And of course, the first thing that I think about is alcohol and alcohol abuse and misuse. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the role of alcohol in in liver damage and what it is and what it isn't? I know you mentioned that sometimes people have misconceptions about the role of alcohol in liver damage. I always joke with patients, everybody knows that alcohol causes liver damage. I say even my high school daughter knows that, and she knows it not because she's my daughter, she just knows it because everybody knows it. But one of the interesting misconceptions, Melissa, is the most common cause of liver disease in the U.S. and in the world is not actually from alcohol. It is not. I tell patients, you know, if I see 20 liver patients in a day, all with liver disease, how many are from alcohol in general? Three or two. The vast majority are from other things. But we'll focus on alcohol now because that's what you asked me about. Alcohol, of course, can cause liver damage in patients. Uh, It often affects very young people, which is sad. Women are more susceptible, Melissa, to alcohol damage in the liver than men are. In fact, twice as much. Wow. If a woman, even if the size of the people are the same, if a woman drinks uh, two glasses of wine, the damage to the liver is the same for a man of four glasses of wine. If a woman drinks four a day, it's the same as a man drinking eight. So women are twice as susceptible to alcohol damage to the liver than men are, first of all. Uh, The other thing that surprises people about alcohol-related liver disease is that a lot of times people drink for years and years and years very heavily. By the way, wine, beer, and liquor all cause the same liver damage. Many patients, I just had one today. He said, oh, doc, I only, I only drank beer. So it shouldn't cause a liver problem. Beer causes the same liver problem that wine and liquor had caused. But uh, one of the things that surprises people, even after drinking heavily for years and years, 10 years, 20 years, The liver sometimes, for some reason, and we don't understand this well, tips over and becomes extremely sick extremely quickly. And people can be feeling normal a month ago and be critically ill now. And when the liver gets like that, it's called alcohol-related hepatitis, the mortality rate, the mortality rate within a month or two can be 25 to 50 percent. So young people can get suddenly sick and have very, very high mortality from alcohol use. There are no special treatments at all. There weren't when I trained decades ago and still today, no special treatments. There's only one thing that helps those patients. And guess what that is? Sobriety. Stop sobriety, stopping drinking, and you have to stop. Surprisingly, the liver gets better a lot of times. The liver is the one organ in the body that can regenerate itself. And it's amazing. And many patients that are critically ill with alcohol-related liver disease, if they don't pass, they survive and they abstain from alcohol use, the liver can recover and many of their symptoms can go away. So it's important If you have alcohol-related liver disease, it's actually more than important. It's critical that somebody stop drinking and stay stopped so that they optimize their chances to survive, be well, spend time with their families, and hopefully be away from people like me. Yeah, the the goal is to get people to never come see you again, which I think is always kind of funny. I know you mentioned, you know, you see 20 liver patients, maybe two or three of them are are dealing with alcohol-related liver issues. What are some of those other patients dealing with? What are what are some of the other causes of liver damage that you see? There are a lot of causes, and this surprises patients sometimes when I tell them that because they I can't tell you how many patients Melissa come to me and they don't drink and they still have liver disease and they're shocked that they could have liver disease when they didn't drink. Many patients have hepatitis, which means liver that has damage ongoing, basically a fire burning, that's inflammation in the liver, and it can be from viruses. So hepatitis C and hepatitis B 
are unrelated but relatively common viruses that can affect the liver and cause liver damage over many, many, many years. Uh, there are diseases called autoimmune liver disease. Many people that are listening to this podcast may have autoimmune diseases. They're all different, but they're related in one way. The one way is they are problems where your own immune system, your own, by mistake, attacks a part of yourself. And there are many of these diseases. There's colitis when the colon's affected. The joints are affected by rheumatoid arthritis. The skin is affected by psoriasis. These are all autoimmune diseases. The liver's actually affected by three of these autoimmune diseases. One is called autoimmune hepatitis. One is called primary biliary cholangitis and one of them is called primary sclerosing cholangitis. They are all different, but they are all autoimmune diseases. And I, as a hepatologist, look for those diseases in patients. There's another group of patients that have things, problems, that they were actually born with, and yet they didn't even know it. They, they, they don't present until they're adults. There are iron problems and copper problems. Uh, there are various different genetic-based problems that affect the liver later on in life. And then finally, Melissa, there is the most common liver disease of all, not only here in this country, but all over the world. In fact, it's an epidemic. It's called fatty liver, fatty liver. Uh, there's a new name for it that our societies have given it. It's called metabolic associated liver disease, uh, or sometimes it's called metabolic associated steatohepatitis. That's the fancy medical term for it, but we call it MASH. Not the sitcom. Not the sitcom. You need to be a certain age on this podcast, Melissa, to know what that sitcom was. We're, we're dating ourselves a little bit I was going to say, I'm giving away that I watched too much TV with my parents to like have a normal conversation, but continue. Well, it's called sa MASH. Well, yeah. Sadly, sadly, Melissa, I watched those shows, not with my parents. I was old <laughs> enough to watch them all by myself, MASH. But out of my 20 patients in a day, by the way, if you said, how many are from this fatty liver problem? I would say 12 to 14. Wow. That's how common it is. Now, I, I want to spend a minute on it because many people listening to this podcast may have been told they have this problem. And maybe their physician or advanced practice practitioner hasn't explained it to them very well because it is so common. This is a problem where fat gets in your liver where it doesn't belong. Now, if you say, what do you mean it doesn't belong there? A normal liver, Melissa, has no fat in it at all or almost none. And yet, for years and years and years, many, many people have fat misplaced into their liver. And in a portion of those patients, over many, many years, not five or 10 years, over 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, the liver slowly, slowly gets damaged, unbeknownst to the patient, unbeknownst to their, to their primary care providers. And in the end, in a small portion of these people, the liver gets very, very damaged and they end up sick, uh, fatty liver or what we now call MASH in some people cause very severe liver problems. I said it was common. It's seen in about 30%, 30% of the entire population wow. in the United States. The estimates are somewhere in the range of 80 to 100 million people in this country have fat in their liver. There's no blood test for that disease. It's seen on pictures of the liver. And as I said, tens of millions of people have this problem. Now, again, only a fraction develop damage from it, but many, many people have it and many, many people will be diagnosed with it. Now, we do know why it happens too. Almost everybody that has this has at least one of three problems. They have problems with their cholesterol. They have diabetes type 2 or most commonly, they're overweight. Those are the three causes. Many people have all three, actually. They're overweight, diabetic, and have problems with cholesterol. You can get fatty liver in that circumstance. 
The treatment of it, Melissa, is to lose weight, keep your sugar down if you're diabetic, and to keep your cholesterol dial down if you have cholesterol problems. For the first time in the world, one month prior to the taping of this podcast was the approval of a new medicine for some people with fatty liver, not everybody. Um, the name of the medicine, the, the generic name is resmeteram, and it just got approved. First medicine ever approved. And it's not appropriate for everybody, but it's appropriate for certain people. So patients that have fatty liver uh, may be uh, instructed by their physicians and providers that this medicine may help them. In a person with fatty liver, you know, the fat deposits in the liver and maybe on the liver, you know, disrupt the normal function. They maybe destroy some of the cells in the liver that do normal liver jobs. Um, and then over time, as more fat is deposited and as more fat is in the liver uh, for a longer period of time, maybe more and more cells are getting damaged. And that sort of has a cumulative effect over time. Is that accurate? For all liver diseases, for all of these fires that we're talking, we're talking about fires. The viruses can be a fire. The autoimmune disease can be the fire. The problems that you're born with can be a fire. Fat can be a fire. Alcohol can be a fire. For all of them, everybody in the end does not get true liver damage. They don't, not, and, not, and not only in fatty liver, in all of these conditions. There are many people that have hepatitis C, for instance, and have it for decades and decades and never get any liver damage at all. What actually is liver damage? What are yeah. you talking about? The medical term for that, and it may be used for some of the patients that are, that are listening to the podcast, is the medical term is called fibrosis. Fibrosis. Fibrosis is scar tissue. So for instance, if anybody's had a bad cut on your body or you had surgery before, you broke a bone or you had a, a, your appendix taken out, the skin has scar tissue on it where, the, where it healed. Well, that's, that's called fibrosis. Even in the skin, it's called fibrosis. Mm. In the liver, some of these fires, but not all in a certain patient, cause fibrosis. And it is the fibrosis, actually, that is the true damage to the liver when it happens. And if you get lots and lots and lots of fibrosis, the scar tissue, which is what that is, starts to damage the function of the liver. It's not the fire so much. It's the fibrosis that happens from the fire. And when the fibrosis gets to be onerous, when it gets to be uh, a spectacular amount in the liver, and it takes years and years for that to happen. In the end, the liver finally starts to not work well, and then the patient starts to actually feel the symptoms. Now, we don't really know why well that patients get, some patients get fibrosis mm -hmm. and others don't. So for instance, with fatty liver, it, approximately 90 to 95 percent of those tens of millions of people will never develop a lot of fibrosis or scar tissue and will not never develop serious liver damage. But about five to 10 percent will. And we don't know why. We sort of why that split happens. It's exactly right. We don't know yet why. But one of the jobs of the hepatologist, me, when I see a patient, like if you came to me and your doctor found that you had elevated liver blood tests, even if you feel great, and said, Melissa, you need to go see Dr. Flam. He's a liver doctor. I would tell you, Melissa, that I'm really trying to find out two things. Why are your liver tests elevated so we can hopefully reverse the fire? And if there's any damage. So we have plenty of time to try to reverse this and make sure that it doesn't develop further. That makes sense. And kind of moving from the process of diagnosing a liver problem, figuring out the cause, you mentioned that only someone with very, very severe fibrosis, a whole lot of scar tissue, that severe level of damage is when you start talking about liver transplant. At the age of 11, I was diagnosed with a chronic kidney disease called glomerulonephritis. nephritis. At that time, my nephrology team let me know that I would eventually need a kidney transplant uh, in my adulthood. When exactly that might be was just unknown given the uncertainty of the disease I had. 
but at 31 I did reach stage 5 renal failure, which meant that I needed to get tested in order to get on the transplant list and find a donor. Luckily, my brother decided that he wanted to get tested to see if he's able to donate his kidney to me. And the process itself to determine that took six months of testing. And at the end, they give the donor the results and lets, lets them uh, decide if they want to continue with the process. The term we use in the medical field, I don't like the term, but it is the term we use. When somebody has very much damage in the liver, the term is called cirrhosis. If people have very severe scarring damage to the liver, very severe fibrosis, we call it cirrhosis. Now, you know, cirrhosis is one of those words, the reason I don't like it, is because it, it, uh, it, it's one of those things that ha it causes a guttural reaction in people. They hear that word and they think, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. And it's actually in many cases not true. Cirrhosis means there's a lot of damage to the liver. We in the medical field are very concerned, but if patients aren't yet sick, they're, they're not very likely to die in the near future, even with the diagnosis of cirrhosis. There are a number of things patients can start to develop that make doctors in my world worried about you. But I'll talk about three or four specifically because they're the most common. One is patients who have cirrhosis that are getting very sick can develop water in their belly, water. They're, they actually can look pregnant. Wow. The medical term for that is ascites, and you can feel it if you're a patient and you start to develop this. You can see it if you do pictures of the liver and the belly. You can see the water in there because there shouldn't be any. That we worry about. That's number one. I mentioned to you earlier, and you mentioned too, Melissa, that one of the jobs of the liver is to clear toxins from the blood. So if the liver becomes impaired enough from damage that it can't even do that. The toxins can escape the liver because the liver can't detoxify them. And they can later go to your brain and make you confused, confused. You may not be the same confused every day. You may be confused more one day than another, but that's another problem that patients can have. This doesn't mean, by the way, that you walk into a room and you said, why did I come in here? We all do that. Or you forget somebody's name that you should remember. We all do that. This is forgetting your daughter's name or having a conversation with somebody for 15 minutes and then 20 minutes later, forgetting that you had the entire conversation. So that term, the problem, the term for that problem is called hepatic encephalopathy, believe it or not. Number three, patients with very bad livers can develop gigantic veins in their esophagus or in their stomach. Can't feel them. They're just inside. Wow. And if you have them, those veins can actually burst and all of a sudden people can start vomiting up blood. That's called variceal bleeding. Varices are the so medical word for the veins and bleeding is bleeding. That, of course, is a serious problem that we worry about. And the fourth thing I want to mention that is a very common problem in people that have liver disease, I just saw a patient with this today, is liver cancer. Patients with cirrhosis can develop liver cancer. Of course, you don't need to be a medical doctor to know that having cancer in your liver is bad. Uh, if you develop any cancer really in your body, but that includes the liver, if you find it when it's very little and early, it's better. We have a much better chance to fix it. If you find it when it's very late and advanced, we can't fix it. If you develop cancer, that's very serious. So once patients, Melissa, develop any of those four things, any of those four things, and there are a few other things too, but those are the main ones. That's when doctors like me become very worried about you because we know your liver is now so sick that your survival is impaired. 
And generally, within one or two years, if you have any of those problems, about 50% of patients are dead without a liver transplant within two years. So it's not cirrhosis necessarily, but it's cirrhosis with one of those complications I mentioned. And once you develop them, those are the patients that should certainly be seen by someone like me. Those are patients that we consider very strongly for liver transplantation. The state that you're in by the time that you need a liver transplant, it sounds like someone is very sick by the time that they come to you or by the time that they get on the transplant list. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm your fictional liver patient here. Can you talk a little bit about the process for being evaluated for transplant, sort of what the typical path is once someone's been identified as a candidate? Once a doctor like me determines that you actually do need one in the correct way, we then refer you to the liver transplantation evaluation clinic. Now, that is a special multidisciplinary clinic, meaning many, many healthcare providers are in one office on one day to evaluate you. Now, that team wants to confirm, first of all, that you need a liver transplant. And then secondly, they want to make sure that you are an appropriate transplant candidate. That's all part of the evaluation. This is not just at Rush, Melissa. This is everywhere in the country. First of all, you have to be healthy enough to actually make it through the surgery. For instance, if somebody's had two heart attacks recently and their heart function is very poor, they are not healthy enough generally to get through a liver transplant surgery, and the team would not consider them as a viable candidate. Number two, if somebody had very bad emphysema from smoking <laughs> and their lungs were very tenuous, they might not be considered well enough for transplant. If somebody has breast cancer that has metastasized to other parts of their body, meaning moved from the breast elsewhere, they have a much bigger problem with their cancer than the liver, and they would not be considered for liver transplantation. So there are medical evaluations that are undertaken on every candidate to make sure that they don't have any other medical problems that would impair their ability to undergo the surgery and then recover from the surgery and have a lifespan after the surgery. There also is an extensive, Melissa, social services workup on all patients that undergo liver transplantation evaluation. And I knew that I was gonna be on liver rejection medicine for the rest of my life. Um, and nobody told me, but I kind of put two and two together that I would never be able to drink again. And, you know, knowing that I had come six months already being sober at that time, that it was just something I was prepared for. People that have alcohol as the reason for their liver disease, and I just mentioned to you, some do, but many don't, but amongst the ones that do, it's very important that they're no longer consuming alcohol. Because if you get a liver transplant, because your first liver was very damaged, and you decide afterwards, hey, I got a new liver now, I can start to drink again. Unfortunately, many, many people do not do well after a liver transplant. They don't take their medicines correctly. The liver is very susceptible to alcohol-related damage after liver transplant, probably even more than before. And patients in general don't do well after liver transplant if they drink alcohol. So if people are drinking alcohol before a liver transplant, even when they find out their liver is deathly sick from the alcohol and they're still drinking alcohol, they can't stop. That is not a good sign for them to have a good outcome after a liver transplant and they would not be candidates. If people are using drugs, cocaine, heroin, that would be a rule out for liver transplantation. If people don't come to the office, there are many people that don't keep their appointments, not because they're sick, but just because they don't really want to come. 
that doesn't work after liver transplant. You need to come to the doctor when you need to come to the doctor. The team doesn't have time to beg you to come to the doctor. So we expect and evaluate people to make sure they are compliant with coming to visits, that they take medicines when they're asked to, because there are some medicines you need to take after a liver transplant, and that they have someone to help them. That's important too. You need to have some support. You need to know is it's not an easy road. It's going to be filled with possible complications. It's going to be filled with a little bit of manageable pain. Um, it's going to be filled with ups and downs. And you need to be mentally, you need to be as mentally tough as you are physically tough in order to get through it. But trust me, when your life is on the line, you're capable of so much. And you just have to be ready for that fight. And I was, and I'm so happy that I'm through it. And hopefully that will be the hardest thing I ever go through. Um, but you should know you're in for a fight. And uh, you can get through it with the amazing people at Rush. They, they know what they're doing. It's going to be long days for both you and the donor. It's going to be a lot of blood work, a lot of x-rays, and seeing different types of doctors, cardiologists, dermatologists, a lot of nephrology, of course. Uh, but of course, it's all just to make sure that the organ is a match, but also that if the donor gives up that organ, are they okay? So it's making sure to consider both parties. What gave me a sense of comfort throughout this process is going through it with my brother. We're very close, so having him by my side was very important. So it takes a little while to recover. You need somebody to help you. You need a family member or a friend or somebody, somebody. at least for a buddy, for a few months that can really help you out. After that, I mentioned to you before, in the vast majority of people, life is normal. But until then, it's not. So these are all evaluated. Uh, and if patients are cleared by the social workers and they don't have any other medical contraindications to a liver transplant, they are listed. They are put on the liver transplant list. They receive a letter that says you are now on the liver transplantation waiting list at Rush. And they are now waiting for life-saving liver transplantation. What are some things that can make it harder or make it take longer to find a liver that's a match? It's the same system everywhere in the United States amongst all of the liver transplant programs. What happens is once you're on the list, your blood tests are followed very, very carefully. And three of them are incorporated into a score, mm -hmm. a score called the MELD score, M-E-L-D. MELD stands for Model for End Stage Liver Disease. Model for End Stage Liver Disease, MELD. There are three blood tests, as I mentioned, that go into the score. Anybody can Google it. All livers in the United States are allocated to waiting recipients on lists by the MELD score. And the higher the MELD score, the higher your priority for a transplant, for getting a liver. So you can be put on the list for one day. And if your score is very, very high, because you're very, very sick already, you can be at the top of the list immediately. They, it, the liver list has nothing to do with waiting time. You don't have to be on it early and sit on it for a long time. It doesn't it's not help first you. come, first serve. Yeah, It is not. And if you have a low score because of your blood tests, you can wait for years mm -hmm. because it's all based on the score. There are exceptions to that, but by and large, that's how it works. So how you get a liver in the first place is your MELD score. Mm -hmm. Now, how does a specific... Are there any specific things about a person that matter different from everybody else? And the answer is yes, there are a couple. First of all, the blood type. 
With some organs, Melissa, that get transplanted, there's a lot of matching of a donor and, a, and you, the recipient, that has to go on. Not so with the liver. Mm -hmm. Livers are very well accepted by other people. They have to match two things, really. One is the blood type. The blood type has to be compatible. Mm -hmm. So there are four blood types, A, B, O, and AB. Those are the four blood types you can have. And there are ways that they match that have to be accommodated. That's number one. And number two, the size of the liver, of course. When they take a liver from a donor and put it in you, it has to fit in you. So if you happen to be a five foot one inch woman waiting for a liver transplant and a donor is a six foot five inch man, the liver is so big in the man that it won't fit in you, the donor. So the surgeons, not me, again, I'm not a surgeon. The surgeons have to make that assessment when they are offered a liver for a patient that's on the waiting list. Do they think the size will match? You can't carve it up, by the way. It's not like, mm. you know, chicken and you can kind of like carve it up a little piece bit. Piece it up, and, yeah. And piece it up and fit it in or trim a bit. There's no trimming. Uh, it either fits or it doesn't. So those are some of the factors that go on that are, uh, you know, uh, important for the surgeons when they assess a donor for an appropriate recipient. Something else that gave me hope that I did not know about before was there's a program called Paired Organ Donation, which essentially is two or more pairs of organ donors and recipients. They trade donors to ensure that each recipient receives an organ that matches their blood and that's compatible to their blood type. And it's, uh, it's a great program because it just gives an opportunity to so many people uh, to get a transplant in the event that their donor doesn't necessarily match them, but they maybe match someone else. So it's just another way to save more lives, which is great. When a liver is donated from a, from a donor, the liver doesn't last long. You, you can't take it out of the donor and put it on the shelf and wait for a day or two while a patient is getting their uh, affairs in order and then do the surgery. That's not how it works. A liver, a liver Melissa, lasts a few hours outside of the donor. That's it. So in fact, if you didn't treat it, there are certain solutions that are used to keep the liver fresh for only a few hours, actually, before it's put in to a recipient, to one of the patients that is in need. And, uh, you know, patients have to come in. We If a liver is offered somewhere else, the team, the surgical team, hears about it. And because it sometimes takes time to get there, for instance, if a liver donor is in Peoria, it takes the team a while to actually get there to get the liver and then get back with the liver. The patient, if they're on the list and they are the person that's called in for the liver transplant, they have to be called in right away. And they, are, they have to drive into the hospital. You can't say, oh, it's nine at night. I'm going to get a good night's sleep and I'll see you at eight in the morning. It's not how it works. You have to come in immediately and you check into the hospital. There are nurses and doctors here that know what to do and where for you to go. And you go there and you wait. Now, on occasion, Melissa, the team gets to the liver donor and for one reason or another, the liver is not what the team was told. It is not as good as the team was told. It is not appropriate for transplantation. And on occasion, they'll call the patient, they'll call the hospital back here at Rush and say, I'm sorry, this liver isn't going to work out. And then the patient goes back home. But that doesn't happen often. It happens on occasion. But the team then goes, if the liver is appropriate, 
They harvest the organ. That's the term we use, meaning they take the organ. We're talking about livers now. By the way, a donor donates kidneys, lungs, heart, pancreas. Donors who donate can save a huge number of lives. The liver is one person, but if a donor donates and they have healthy organs, they can save a lot of different people. That's why being a donor is so nice and so helpful for so many patients and so many families. The decision is the donor's decision. This was a, you know, his, his, this was Alfonso's decision to do this, right? Went to the Secretary of State to renew his driver's license. He decided to do that. Wonderful. I thought that that was just public knowledge. It is not. It is not, and that was very, very shocking to me. I thought that the hospital staff would know that, and that, you know, when he came in, it's somehow part of his medical record or something, and it's not. It's not. So I was, you know, educated in that way, and that this was his decision, right? So that's number one. And number two, it was only, you know, disclosed to people who needed to know once it was determined that his life was no longer viable. So. Why not do it? Like, you, you, you know, we, we need to do it. We need to do it. So, Our team will take the liver and bring it back. And they use the solution to keep the liver fresh. And then once the liver gets back, the patient is taken to the operating room and the transplant is taken care of. Uh, and then the patient goes to the recovery room and eventually to the intensive care unit for recovery. Now, the procedure itself, Melissa, can take any number of hours. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-hour operation. Mm -hmm. It's often a four-hour operation or a six-hour operation. All occasionally. those tubes and blood tubes. vessels you got to get connected. Yeah. That's exactly right. And these are sick people that are getting mm -hmm. the transplant, too. They're not healthy people, which makes the surgeries more challenging. And you know, four hours, six hours, even eight hours sometimes it takes. The surgeons uh, work very, very hard. And as I mentioned earlier, are very, very good. And they get the liver into the patient after they take the other one out, by the way. Mm -hmm. They do take the liver out. You don't have two livers walking around. They take the sick one out and put the new one in, in its place. And you now have a brand new liver. One other thing I get asked too, maybe this is pertinent to some of the questions you asked earlier, is when a person has a sick liver, <clears throat> can you only take the sick part out and leave a healthy part in? And the answer is no, you can't. The whole thing is sick. The scarring, the fibrosis are little bands and they wind their way in and out and through the liver from stem to stern. There isn't a good part and a bad part. It's like finding the mold whole, in your bread, right? You that, want to make that, sure that, you know, it's just one piece. Maybe I can rip it off, but you know that there's spores and other problems happening in the loaf. That's exactly right. But you can actually see this. It's not even mm. silent. You can, if you look at the liver, I, you know, I always tell patients if I, when they're sitting in my office, I said, if I took your liver out and put it on the counter here, I say, I don't advise this. But if I did, and you looked at it with your eyes, you're not a doctor, but you would know your liver is very sick. You can see it. You can see it. Even a non-expert can tell that a liver is very sick. And it's mm -hmm. the whole liver. It's from one side to to the other. So there's not a sick part and a good part. It's all sick. So when they do a transplant, they take the whole sick liver out. If it has cancer in it, the cancer is out and they put in a new, fresh liver. You know, around the country, people are trying to make the process better and faster so that people can have access to these life-saving organ donations in a more timely way. Can you talk a little bit about um, the Organ Procurement Center at Rush and sort of how that is helping um, to improve access to viable organs for people who need them? Rush was selected amongst numerous applicants among, for all for this area to be the single organ procurement center for transplantation. And there are many other transplant centers that vied for this uh, center 
and our application was selected. So I think this serves as a testimonial to how respected and committed that Rush is to the transplantation world. And th this was the first organ procurement center that I'm aware of in our area of its kind, too. Now, livers, all organs, basically, solid organs, livers, hearts, lungs, kidneys, pancreas, they are, uh, they are kind of administered on an administrative basis from centers all sprinkled around the country. The one in the Chicago mm -hmm. area is called Gift of Hope. And they kind of administer it because if you thought as a patient, how, who keeps the list? Gift of Hope does. Who organizes yeah. it and who makes the phone call? Right. Who makes the call from the donor and connects everybody? That's this Gift of Hope. Well, in the past, what's happened is uh, when, a, when a donor becomes available, and they can come available anywhere, Melissa. Could sure. be Peoria. I mean, in this area, because we're going to focus on the Chicago area. And could be Peoria. Could be the Quad Cities. You know, not Champagne, in you Chicago. Know, Indianapolis, yeah. Champagne. So, so what happens is there is a donor there. They are considered, mm -hmm. now I'm going to describe the typical scenario. They have something terrible that has happened and they are considered brain dead, but they're still, their body is still alive, but they're not alive. And they sit in an ICU because they have to be sustained, even though they're brain dead, until the organs are harvested, not only the liver, but all of them. And they have to go to the operating room at that center and have all these operations to take all these organs out. It's not one. The kidneys, the liver. Oh wow! There's an order, by the way. The organs, are, the organs are taken out in a certain order, and teams come from all over the place depending on where that the 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 organs were offered. Just because we get the liver at Rush, the kidneys mm -hmm. might go to another center, and the heart might go to a third center, and the lungs to a fourth center. So there's all wow. different teams. It's not one surgical team. They're all different teams. They come from all over the place. They're all around. And there's an order. They don't fight with each other. You know, they have scalpels. They're surgeons. You wouldn't want a, a sword fight in the OR. So there's an order, and it's very orchestrated. But, you know, these are small hospitals, many of them. They don't have a lot of ICU beds. They don't have a capacity. They don't have big operating rooms. They don't have a lot of operating rooms. And they need a lot of – there's a lot of surgeons around. So I think it became clear that this wasn't optimal for donors spread around in sometimes very small hospitals. So a decision was made to have one in this area, Organ Procurement Center, which again, Rush was selected. And what's going to happen is once a donor is identified at any of these places, they will be brought here to our Organ Procurement Center, all of them from this entire area. And the organs, all of them, will be procured from the donor here at Rush in a brand new operating room with a brand new intensive care unit dedicated only for this purpose. And we it's not all, again, not all the organs will come here. They're, the other teams will come here. But because it will be very streamlined, because there will be dedicated intensive care rooms and operating rooms, once we get the donor here, they will be brought here by ambulance, um, <clears throat> then the theory is it will be much, much more efficient for everybody, for the donors, for the uh, families of the donors, for the teams, and really increase the quality of outcomes from transplant, again, not only liver, kidneys, pancreas, lungs, heart. Um, and again, all of these teams are going to be coming here to Rush University. And, uh, and you know, this was, I think this was a singular achievement for our transplant program to be able to win this organ procurement center. And again, it, I think, provides a testimonial to our dedication and commitment to transplant and uh, and as our programs continue to build in stature, uh, this is going to be one of the central pieces.
The experience I had here, I had, well, not just I, my family had here at Rush with Alfonso and Alfonso's family, and the, um, the treatment that we received. So comforting, so compassionate, the kindness, the generosity of the staff was immeasurable. Immeasurable. I really, really, really feel honored to have been here. So this was very difficult. Literally, we woke up that morning, just like you and I are talking now, and then he just wasn't. So there was no progression. He was, and then he wasn't. So talking about it, getting it, you know, to tell my story, to tell his story, creates a legacy. You know, his gifts went all over the United States. I, I, I'm still amazed. <laughs> I know that living liver donation is possible um, in, in humans. I guess, could you talk a little bit about living liver donation, when it makes sense for someone, and is it more effective or less effective than receiving a liver from someone who is deceased? Living donation for organs in general has been done for quite some time. And in fact, kidneys it's been very commonly employed for years and years and years and years because people have two kidneys and they only need one. They only need one. So if somebody is on dialysis because both of their kidneys have failed, you can donate one of your healthy ones to them and they're now healthy and don't need dialysis and you're still healthy because you still have the one kidney that's healthy that you need. So they've been doing this really for decades. Liver is much more complicated because it's one organ. It's very bloody. You need it. It's not that easy to cut it. Uh, and yet, about 25 years ago, they did the first adult to adult living liver donation transplant in the United States. And it's grown somewhat over the last 25 years or so, to get a, to be a living liver donor, the donor has to be what I always term as perfectly healthy. They have to be perfectly healthy. Their liver has to be perfectly healthy. They have to be young. Each program that does these has an age cutoff, but usually it's around 55. The patient also has to be relatively thin because if they're not thin, if they're overweight, even if they're otherwise healthy, they might have fatty liver too, like I mentioned to you, very many overweight people have. And that liver is not suitable to do a surgery on, to transplant into somebody else. So it's actually very, a very challenging and difficult surgery. You end up taking about 60%, 60, about between a half and two thirds of the donor's liver out Wow. And give it to the sick recipient. You take their whole liver out again, the bad one, and put in this 60% new one. So the donor has 40% of their liver left, and the recipient has 60% of their liver that was given to them from the donor. Um, now, it turns out the cool part about liver, I mentioned this to you briefly before, Melissa, is livers regenerate, particularly healthy ones. And the liver grows back in both people wow. to the correct size, usually within a month. It's amazing. Uh, now, because it's such a complicated surgery and because it's so difficult to find donors, programs that do living donors don't do that many. Generally, if a program does 10 or 15 a year, that's a lot. And it's a lot of work to be honest with you, for a relatively small number of liver transplants. So we at Rush right now don't do living donor liver transplants. Mm -hmm. It's it's not necessary usually, but for a small number of people, it might be indicated. For instance, there are a small number of people that need liver transplant, but don't have a high score, that mm -hmm. MELD score we mentioned, so that so that they they do not have high priority to get allocated a liver. So if somebody needs a liver transplant, if they're a good candidate, if they don't have high priority, they can sometimes benefit from living liver donation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
that's good to know and a, a great explanation of a of a complex procedure like you mentioned. You know, I, I saw this article this week and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it, about pig organs being transplanted into human beings. Is that a thing that will happen widely anytime soon? Is that uh, staying in, in research centers far away from here? Sort of what's your take on the future of transplant tech? Well, Melissa, another great question. You know, many more people need liver transplantation than we have organs available. So we're always trying to figure out ways to increase availability of livers for patients in need. For many, 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 many years, one of my fellow attendings, a surgeon that I worked with formerly, Dr. Jonathan Fryer, years ago, 25 years ago, was trying to do research in transplantation of a pig liver into a human. And the problem has always been rejection, rejection. You know, rejection means, Melissa, that your body, when you put something else in it that's not part of you, it gets recognized as not being part of you, foreign. And our immune systems generally don't like that. We reject it. We try to get rid of it. And we have very good strategies when it's a human to a human to provide therapy so that we decrease the response, the rejection response, and we don't have very much substantial problems with rejection from a human to human liver transplant mm -hmm. procedure. Now, when you transplant another animal into a human, uh, that's a completely different situation. Your body rejects that like absolute crazy. Yeah. And, and your body doesn't like it. And we have not yet been able to develop strategies to tamp down that vicious rejection response that we have to those organs. Now, I don't know a lot about this, but mm -hmm. the little I've heard is that they're trying to genetically engineer the livers in the pigs so that they're less provocative and they are less likely to provoke this vicious rejection response because of the genetic engineering that they're doing of the organ. And the hope is because this, that, that because of this genetic engineering that even though their livers from pigs that they don't have this strong response and that we can tamp down the immune response and, and we're able to succeed for that. Now, this research, I would say, Melissa, is in its infancy. It's kind yeah. of at the beginning. But, you know, humans are very clever people and they yes. try to really solve problems and they often do solve problems that present themselves over time. So it wouldn't be a surprise to me if one day we're able to transplant a genetically engineered organ from a different species into humans and um, increase the availability of donor organs for needy patients. Absolutely. You know, obviously we're putting in pig organs into a human body. The human body is going to uh, hard reject, return to sender, do not want, get this out of here. Um, but can you talk a little bit about... Um, organ rejection in liver transplant from human to human transplant. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about how that's managed medically? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. You know, again, rejection just means your body doesn't like it when another organ or anything else for that matter is put into it and it fights it. It tries to, to destroy it. Mm -hmm. Now, when organs are transplanted in you, different organs cause rejection at different rates. Mm. And the severity of the rejection and how easy it is to treat the rejection are very different with different organs. Uh, kidneys are different than livers. Livers are different than hearts. Hearts are different than lungs. They're all very, very different. Now, amongst the organs that I'm most familiar with, there is 
a problem with liver rejection, but it is not very common. It happens in about 30% or less of patients that get a transplant. It is almost always mild, and the treatment for liver is usually just change, changing around a little bit the medications that you take to prevent the rejection in the first place. And almost always, that's successful. How you know someone's having rejection is you check their labs and their liver blood tests are off. Because after a liver transplant, they have a normal liver, so their liver blood test should be perfect. And then they do a biopsy of the liver and look under the microscope and you can see the rejection if it's occurring. But then you treat the patient and the liver tests go back to normal and the patient does very, very well. I would say, Melissa, in my more than 25 years of doing this and having seen more than 2,500 liver transplants, it is exceedingly uncommon for a patient to ever lose their liver actually because of rejection. It does happen with other organs more commonly, but not the liver usually. It's, it's generally not a big thing in the liver world for transplant. That's great for both you and the recipients of those new livers that it's lower on the worry list as far as complications after surgery. Would you say there's an emotional recovery piece to organ transplant? What kind of aftercare do you find that patients need sort of emotionally or psychologically after an organ transplant? You know, I'd say that's variable. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, some people have a little kind of, I'd say, post-traumatic stress disorder a little bit because they were so sick so fast often, and then undergo this life-saving procedure and then have to recover from it, that it is somewhat traumatic and it is somewhat stressful. But I can tell you this, most of the patients feel so much better, generally so quickly, that they are beyond happy. You know, I might see them because they're here for some other appointment in the lobby of the hospital or, or in the cafeteria, and they run over to see me and they give me a big hug and they say, you know, I haven't seen you for a long time. I'm, I don't even recognize them, Melissa, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> because when I saw them for the at the beginning, for the most part, they were very sick. And, uh, you know, and their muscles were gone and they were gaunt. And now they look like normal human beings. So sometimes I look at them and say, "You, I kind of recognize you. Remind me, what's your name? And they, because I haven't seen them for six months or a year because they've been so well. And they tell me their name and I'm saying, oh my goodness, you look fabulous. So yes, everybody's different. You know, for people that drank alcohol before transplant, we have to be very careful with them after transplant to make sure or to help them not drink again because that's a problem if they do. Mm -hmm. Patients, you know, based on what disease they had to begin with, may need some observation after liver transplant to make sure something doesn't come back in their new liver. But in general, people don't require a lot of care. There are a few things, though, after any transplant that are increased from a medical side. Number one, uh, there is a slight increased risk of skin cancer. Really? After, yeah, after any of the transplants, not just liver. And that's related to the medications you take. So uh -huh. patients after almost any of the organ transplants, but liver, because that's what we're talking about today, they require or we urge them to have a dermatology evaluation once a year just to kind of check out their skin. Patients after liver transplant can have um, osteoporosis or bone thinning a little bit. They can get that before from their liver disease too. But we always recommend having a bone densitometry or what we call a DEXA scan every few years after liver transplant. And then we also recommend just taking general good care of yourself, mammograms for women, prostate blood tests for men, colonoscopy for colon cancer screening in everybody, vaccinations so that you don't get infections that can be avoided 
after liver transplant, keeping in mind you are on these immune suppression medicines that are the medicines we use to help tamp down the immune system so that you don't get rejection, which I meant, I meant, which I previously said was a very, not a huge issue, but it's not a huge issue because people take these medications. Pills, yeah. They take the pills. And, um, but again, if you are a little bit immunosuppressed, meaning your immune systems are not as strong, we don't want you getting the flu and COVID and things like that if we can avoid it. And that's why the team strongly recommends vaccination after transplant. So there are certain medical recommendations we do to try to make things even better for patients. Kind of standard stuff. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. You want to try and stay as healthy as you can after, a, first of all, such a big surgery. And second of all, second chance at life for most of these people. This is kind of a funny question. Do you find that traits uh, show up in, in recipients from their donor? If, I always think that's a great question. You know, I don't think traits, there, there are no data to confirm that that happens. Although, you know, patients sometimes tell me, you know what, doctor, ever since I got my liver transplant, and I, you know, I like burgers now. I never <laughs> liked burgers in my whole life. And now I like burgers, you know, or they'll say something like that. They'll say, I wonder if my donor liked burgers. Mm, yeah. So, so, uh, you know, sometimes you hear these kinds of things. Uh, um, I had a man one time say, you know, I, I always liked brunettes. In my whole life, I liked brunettes. And now he says, now I like blondes. All now he's a sudden. blonde guy, yeah. He's a blonde guy. And he said, I swear it's my new liver. You know, I said, so I don't know, you know. I, there is that no where data. the seat of attraction is, the liver? <laughs> uh, we need to I update all our Valentine's so. decorations. Yes, exactly. I, I don't think so, but uh, I guess you never know. Uh, stranger things have happened. And, and anecdata is always so interesting. Is it possible for um, recipients of liver donation to meet their donor family member if they don't know them? Is that something that happens at all? It is possible, the last I heard at least. Uh, I would say it's rare, mm -hmm. but I have mm -hmm. seen it happen. In fact, I must tell you, since you brought this up, the guy that told me he used to like brunettes and now like blondes was an older guy. He was like 60 when he had his transplant. He is one of the few that did meet the donor family. And the donor family told me that the young son that had donated the liver to him liked blondes. So he was convinced that, convinced. you know, he was picked up the characteristic of the donor. I mean, if a recipient wants to meet the donor family, the recipient in the past, at least, I don't know if this has changed very recently, but the recipient would notify the gift of hope, who's the mm -hmm. administrator of the organ uh, process, organ transplant process. The gift of hope would then contact the, in, uh, anonymously contact the donor family and ask if they're interested in meeting the recipient. And if they say yes, they do, or they're willing to, then they will connect the two. And uh, so it can happen. You know, a lot of times it doesn't. There, there's a lot of emotion, I think, on the donor side because it involves somebody passing and donating organs. And while the family is very grateful that their loved one's organs have saved other people, and many times I think it's it's very emotional for them to actually see that person in real life. Um, and and it, so it doesn't happen too often, I think, but it can. What would be the most important thing you want listeners to know about liver disease and organ transplant? Well, about liver disease in the first place, I think it's very important to know that many people have liver disease. It is very commonly not from alcohol because it's a stigmatization that patients have when they're told they have a liver problem. It's very important for you to follow up with a GI or liver doctor for evaluation, even if you don't feel badly. If you wait until you don't feel badly, your chances of needing a liver transplant are much greater. We have many therapies to help people with liver disease to avert worsening of their liver process and the need for liver transplant before it even happens. 
And then if somebody's very sick, we want you to, you know, come in, see the team, keep an open mind, because many people we can help. And if you do receive life-saving liver transplantation, your life can be normal again or close to normal again, and you can enjoy years and years and years, you know, with your family, with your job, you know, and, and just be here and be healthy. Uh, so, and, and, and you got to take care of yourself too. I always say that mm -hmm. this is just in general, you know, I always, I tell my kids this too, Melissa, you know, the sad thing is the older you get, the more you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and that means you try to keep your weight down and don't drink alcohol excessively. And, you know, I always say it's sad, but you have to take care of yourself if you want to stay away from people like me, which most <laughs> people do. So I guess those are my parting messages. That's our show, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for my conversation with Dr. Stephen Flam here at Rush. We talked a lot about liver transplants, what even causes you to need a liver transplant in the first place. I hope that you've learned a lot. I certainly have. Join us next time for a conversation about uterine fibroids, another chronic condition we'll be covering here on Rush. Now what? <laughs>